In this video, we're going to talk about infinite series or just series. Here we're going to look at an introduction. In the next video, we'll look at some more properties. So an infinite series or just a series is the sum of infinitely many numbers. We can think of it as the sum of the terms of a sequence. So if I had a1, a2, a3, a4, if we add them all up, we get a series. And here's an example. If I take 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus a half plus a fourth and so on, I can write that in summation notation using the summation n equals 1 to infinity of 8 times the fraction 1 half to the power of n minus 1. And we should recognize this as a geometric series where r equals 1 half and a equals 8. And for the longest time, this was quite puzzling to uh, even mathematicians is that the fact that you have infinitely many numbers, you're adding them together, they're all positive. Should this not grow without bound? Well, in our case, we can think about improper integrals. We had a, the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx. And we wanted to know, does that even make sense? I mean, certainly it seems like there would be infinitely an infinite amount of area under this curve, but we found that it could be convergent or divergent. And what we would do is first replace the infinity with a parameter like alpha, find the uh, definite integral of f of x dx from one to alpha, which if we had an antiderivative, that would just be uh, capital F of alpha minus capital F of one and then take the limit as alpha goes to infinity. And we found that if that limit exists and is finite, then we would say that the improper integral is convergent, and otherwise the improper integral is divergent. Well, we can use a similar process to make sense of an infinite series. What we're gonna do is replace the infinity with some finite positive integer, which we'll call uppercase n. So now we only have a finite number of terms and in fact, n terms, uppercase n terms. And this is what we call the nth partial sum. So partial sums means that you just simply stop after a specific number of terms and you forget about all of the rest of the terms. So in our geometric series, the first partial sum, it's not really a sum, but we just use the phrase, uh, is just going to be the first term. The second partial sum is the sum of the first two terms. The third partial sum is the sum of the first three terms, and so on. So that's our first step, is we're going to replace our infinity with a positive integer n, get a partial sum. And then we want to find a useful formula for that partial sum, because our next step is to take the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n. So I put this in red because this is the most challenging part, is to find that useful formula. So if the limit of the partial sums, so this is a sequence now, we have a sequence of partial sum, if that limit exists and is finite, we say the series is convergent. Otherwise, uh, the series is divergent. So again, a series is convergence if the sequence of partial sums is convergence. So we're not necessarily looking at the individual terms, we're looking at the partial sums. So geometric series, let's go through this information a little bit slower. So the terms of a geometric series form a geometric sequence. And um, their common ratio, of course, is r. So a geometric series is we're adding up all the terms. A geometric sequence, we're just listing the terms. The common ratio in each case, though, 
uh, is going to be the uh, next term over the previous term, which is always going to be the same. And in this case, it is one half. And A is, we use the letter A to denote the first term. So in our example, A equals eight. And so we can write out a geometric series in summation notation as the sum from n equals one to infinity of a times r to the power of n minus one. We have the n minus one because we want r to the zero power to give just a as my first term. And then I get powers of r added multiplied by a and then added on to the sum. So the nth partial sum would stop with a times r to the power of n minus one. Because we start with a power of r to the zero, we end with a power r to the power of n minus one. So we wanna find a useful formula for s sub n, our nth partial sum, because the formula that we came up with it's not very useful uh, if you want to take the limit as n goes to infinity. But if I take that formula and multiply both sides by r, and then subtract the bottom equation from the top equation, well, all of the terms are going to add out, except for the very first one, and the very, the very first one in the top and the very last one in the bottom. And so I can do some algebra, I'll factor out S sub N from the left side, A from the right side, divide by one minus R. Now I've got a useful formula because if I had let the limit as N goes to infinity, since uh, if I know that R is, less than one in absolute value, then that term is going to go to zero. And I'll be left with our familiar uh, formula for the sum of a geometric series, which would be a over one minus r. Now that's only true if the absolute value of r is less than one. If it's greater than or equal to one, then uh, either the limit of the partial sums is infinite or it does not exist. And so then we would have a divergent series. So for a geometric series, if our common ratio in absolute value is less than one, then the series is convergent and we have a formula for the sum. And otherwise the series is divergent. So for the example we've been looking at, a equals eight, r equals one half, and so its sum would be 16. A nice application of geometric series is converting repeating decimals to a common fraction. So if I have 0 0.16 repeating, so both the one and the six repeat, I can write that as a sum of fractions, 16 over 100, plus 16 over 10,000, plus 16 over a million, each time I'm adding two zeros to the number in the denominator. And so my first term is 16 over 100, and my common ratio is one over 100. So I can put those numbers into my formula for the sum, one minus uh, one over 100 is 99 over 100, which simplifies to 16 over 99. In the second example, I have to be a little bit more careful because I have 0.36, but only the six is repeating. And so I have this three tenths, which is really outside of our series, our geometric series. It's only the terms that have a six in the numerator, which form part of our geometric series. So the first term of our geometric series is going to be the uh, six over 100, and then the common ratio is one tenth. 
So I put that into my formula. Now note that the three over 10 is really just outside the series. So it's always going to be there and we're just going to keep it there until the very end after I do the arithmetic for the formula for the infinite series, the geometric series, I'll work out the fractions, find a common denominator, and finally bring that together as one fraction, 11 over 30. So again, we have a two-step process. We need to find a useful formula for the nth partial sum, and then n goes to infinity and find the limit of that sequence of partial sums. So here's an example. Um, we need to find a uh, formula for the nth partial sum and then take the limit to see if that limit exists and is finite. So let's look at some partial sums. The first partial sum is a half. The second partial sum is the sum of the first two terms, which turns out to be two thirds. Third partial sum works out to be three fourths. And I think I see a pattern, but let's just see if it keeps going with the fourth partial sum. There's a definite pattern where the nth partial sum is just going to be n over n plus one. So now I can take the limit as n goes to infinity for that formula and I get one. So this is a convergent uh, infinite series and the sum is one. Let's look at the same example in a different way. I could look at the partial fraction decomposition of the uh, formula for the terms one over n times parentheses n plus one. So I'll have two fractions then, a constant over n plus a different constant over n plus one. And we know how to find those constants. We multiply through by the common denominator. We get a, and then from there we can see that a equals one and b must equal negative one. So now we're taking the sum of this formula given with the difference of two terms, one over n minus one over n plus one. Well, let's look at some of the partial sums here. First partial sum, uh, not, no, nothing we can do there, no simplification. And the second partial sum, I can see that I have a negative one half and a positive one half. So that collapses to just one minus one third. And the third partial sum, I still have the negative one half and the positive one half, but then I can have a negative one third and a positive one third. So everything is zero except for the first and last term. It collapses to one minus one fourth. And so I'm starting to see a pattern here, but let's do one more case. So the negative one half plus one half, negative one third plus one third, negative one fourth plus one fourth. So again, everything is zero except for the first and last terms. So I can have a nice formula then for the nth partial sum as being one minus one over n plus one. And as n goes to infinity, the second term goes to zero. So I'm just left with one, the same result I had before. So this is an example of what we call a telescoping series because all of the parts in the middle collapse to zero and it reminds us of an old-fashioned spyglass which collapses in the middle so we call it a telescoping series so let's look at a couple of examples of telescoping series here we have um, the summation of natural log of n over n plus one. Well, I can expand that to be the sum of natural log of n minus the natural log of n plus one. And let's look at some partial sums to see if we can determine a formula. So by the time I get to the third partial sum, again, I see it's the same case that the everything except for the first and last terms. So I want to give you some caution here. It's not always the first and the last terms. 
that uh, are left over. Uh, and we're going to see that in the next example. Uh, but here, it is the case. And so the nth partial sum would just be the natural log of 1 minus the natural log of n plus 1. Well, the natural log of 1 is 0, so that's just minus natural log of n plus 1. And now, as n goes to infinity, that's going to go to negative infinity. So this telescoping series is diverging. So now here we have in our next example, 1 over n cubed minus n. I have to start with n equals 2, because when n equals 1, 1 over n cubed minus n is not defined. So we're going to use the partial fractions decomposition. I'm not going to go through the details here, but it's the same process that we used before. We'll get a system of equations, and we can uh, solve that system. And now we actually have three terms. So I have a negative 1 over n plus 1 half in the brackets 1 over n plus 1 plus 1 over n minus 1. And our summation again starts from 2. So even though I don't have an s sub 1, I'm going to start with an s sub 2. And the first term really doesn't show me any kind of pattern. Uh, so I'm going to actually skip s sub 3 and go to s sub 4 because I'm trying to look for a pattern. So bigger numbers are going to help me find a pattern. So not much. I'm starting to see some things. I can see I have a, a negative 1 half, and then this will be a positive 1 half. I see that I have this negative 1 third, and I've got a positive half 1 third and another positive half 1 third. So those are going to add out. Let me go to the sixth partial sum. And now I can really start to see what's going on here. Is that, okay, I always have this negative 1 half being added to this 1 uh, plus a half. So that's going to make 0. And then I had the negative 1 third. And to the left of it, I had a half of a one-third. And to the right of it, I had a half of one-third. So that was going to add to uh, zero. In S sub 6, I see that pattern continuing. For negative one-fourth, I have to the left of it half of one-fourth. And to the right of it, another half of one-fourth. Same thing with one-fifth. I have negative one-fifth here. To the left of it, I have a half of one-fifth. And to the right of it, I have another half of one-fifth. So this term without the half always seems to add out with part of the term before it and part of the term after it. And in fact, for the sixth partial sum, I see that I'm going to have this one-fourth. This one-half times one-half is going to give me a one-fourth. And in fact, that is always going to be there. I'm never going to be able to get rid of that one-fourth uh, because uh, we started with uh, n equals 2. And, and we can't start with n equals 1 because there is no a sub 1 term, it would be undefined. And then what's left over is I have this half times 1 sixth, then I have a minus 1 sixth, and then I have a plus half times 1 seventh. Or if I try to write that in terms of n, uh, that would be the 1 fourth. That's always there. These combine together to be minus 1 half times 1 6. So I have a minus 1 half times 1 over n plus 1 half times 1 over n plus 1. So I went ahead and looked at uh, s sub 8, the 8th partial sum, and the ninth partial sum. And I verified that our pattern continued. So this formula holds true for all uh, n 
at least greater than six. And again, we don't care what happens with the first few terms. It's what happens at the tail, because now we're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity. Well, these terms, which have an n in the denominator, will go to zero, and I'll just left be with one fourth. So this is a convergent sum and the uh, convergent series, and the sum is one fourth. So for our last example, this is kind of hinting as to where we want to go in this chapter. For what values of x is this series convergent? So in this series, you can think of x as being a fixed number. It's the n that changes. So we're going to look at this as a geometric series. I'm going to write x plus 2 to the power of n as x plus 2, parentheses, times in parentheses, x plus 2 to the power of n minus 1. So as a geometric series, my first term would be x plus 2, and my common ratio is also x plus 2. And so in order for this to be a convergent geometric series, we need to have the common ratio, the absolute value of the common ratio, to be less than 1. So I have now an equation in in x, actually an inequality in x. The absolute value of x plus 2 has to be less than 1. Well, that's the same as x plus 2 being greater than negative 1 and smaller than positive 1. And to solve this for x, I'll just subtract 2 from the left, the middle, and the right side, giving me x is between negative 3 and negative 1. So we can say that our original series is convergent when x is between negative 3 and negative 1. So there's still more properties of series that we will discuss, and we'll leave that for the next video.